English. Good morning. Good morning. The rich man also died and was buried. 
In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and to cool my tongue. For I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then Father Abraham, I beg you, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Father Abraham answered him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced even if someone raises from the dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Come and find your way into our hearts that are prone to wander and get lost. Come and find your way to us and help us find our way to you as we hear your word read and proclaimed this hour. And help us to live in faithfulness and obedience for all of our days. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading begins this way. Now all of the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. Let's stop there and take a look at who the characters are in this story. We have Jesus, who is still on the road to where? Jerusalem. To Jerusalem. We have some unhappy religious leaders who do not like the company that Jesus keeps. And then we have the company. Tax collectors and sinners. I think we should try to understand better who these sinners are. How many of you would say that you are a sinner? I thought so. You're probably thinking of Paul's letter to the Romans, where he writes, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Well, Luke never got to read Paul's letter. While Luke might have agreed with Paul's idea that all people commit sins, Luke would not be ready to label all people sinners. You see, for Luke, the term was just that. It was a label. When Luke describes someone as a sinner, he's talking about someone who's pattern of sinning is so habitual that the whole community knows about it. To be a sinner was not only to be a person who sins, but it was to be known in the community by your sin. To be defined by it. In modern terms, a sinner a sinner is the guy that you would not let your daughter date. Well, you know who that is. A sinner is the woman who's a bad influence on your sister. Oh, we know who that is. Maybe a sinner is that 
uncle that you don't talk about because he has brought shame on your whole family. For Luke, and for the Pharisees in Luke's story, sinners are not just people who sin, like we can all think of ourselves that way, but they are people whose sin defines how the community understands them. These are the kinds of people that Luke's Pharisees are thinking about when they begin to grumble about the company that Jesus keeps. And the grumbling prompts Jesus to tell a couple of stories. Which one of you, Jesus says, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me! For I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who need no repentance. Or what woman, having 10 silver coins, a silver coin in that day would be like a hundred dollar bill today. So we're not really talking about dimes. We're talking about Benjamins. What woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors and says, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So here's the question that makes me scratch my head when I hear these stories. What do a lost sheep and a lost coin have to do with sinners and repentance? Are they supposed to represent the sinners that the religious leaders look down on? Maybe we could blame the sheep for wandering off, but we can hardly blame a coin for getting lost. There's no implication in the story that the sheep tries to find his way back home to the farmer. I'm certain that the silver coin didn't wiggle its way out of the couch cushions and into the plain sight of the searching, desperate woman. So what do a sheep and a coin have to do with sinners and repentance? If we keep reading, it soon becomes clear that these stories are not really about the difference between sinners and good folk, righteous folk. Rather, they are about the things we lose and the experience of being lost. Throughout Lent, we are remembering that we are on a journey with Jesus to Jerusalem. And any time you think about traveling, you have to also think about getting lost. I'll tell you, there are some of the best fights that Eric and I have had have been when we're driving, and I, he's driving, and I'm supposed to be navigating, and we get lost. Can you think of a time when you have been lost? You might think of a time when you were physically lost, Unsure of how to get back to a familiar place? Or maybe you can think of a time when you felt socially lost, without a sense of where you belonged. Have you been lost emotionally? Unsure of what would make you feel better? Maybe you have felt spiritually lost. 
without a community or a faith tradition or a sense of God's presence to buoy you up. If you can think of an example of a time when you've been lost, I want you to share that story with someone who's sitting nearby you. We might not all have a story that comes to our head immediately, but take a minute and think of it, if you can think of a story of a time when you've been lost physically or socially or emotionally or spiritually, share that story with a neighbor. If you don't have a neighbor sitting next to you, find one a little farther away. in a room full of maybe 200 people without a single person that I knew that I could eat lunch with. Those were lost times for me. Jesus also knew a story about being lost. And he told that story to those grumbling religious leaders. It goes like this. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of the sons said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So the father divided his property between his two sons. A few days later, the younger son gathered everything that he had and he traveled to a distant country. And while he was there, he squandered his property in dissolute living. After he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country. And this younger son began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him out into the fields to feed the pigs, the dirtiest animals of all. He was so hungry that he would have gladly filled himself with the waste that the pigs were eating. But no one gave him anything. We call this the parable of the prodigal son. I had to look up the word prodigal. It seems like another one of those churchy words. It turns out it's not a particularly churchy word. It's just old-fashioned. When prodigal is used as an adjective, and this is straight from the dictionary, it means wasteful, extravagant, 
imprudent, or reckless. When we think about this younger son, that sounds about right. Prodigal, reckless, wasteful. It also sounds just like that definition of sinner that those religious leaders probably have in mind. Probably resonates a little bit with our definition of sinner, too. Somebody who's reckless, careless, wasteful. Jesus keeps going with the story. When this younger son came to himself, some translations read, came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have enough bread and more to spare? And here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and I'll go to my father and I'll say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am not worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. Indeed, this seems to be a story about a sinner recognizing his reckless ways and repenting. Although this young man might return home with apologies, even genuine apologies, real sorrow, he cannot repay his father and his older brother for the inheritance that he squandered. It's gone. Half the farm, it's gone. And he can't fix the shame that he's brought on his family by his embarrassing behavior. It's only fair that he should have to work on his father's farm. I think this is what we call justice. The sinner son finds his own way home, he gets a fresh start, and an opportunity to restore what was lost through his work. But there's more. While he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran, picked up his robes, and ran. It's hard to run in something like this. He ran and kissed him. And the son said to him, just as he had thought, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly, quickly bring out the robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fattest calf and kill it for us to eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and he is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. There's a second definition of prodigal in the dictionary. Also, you know, there's number one and then number two. So number two definition of prodigal means having or giving something on a lavish scale. Generous, liberal, extravagant, bounteous. In this sense, prodigal is exactly how we might describe the father. He does not want justice for his son. He wants the family to be whole again. That's what the robe and the ring and the sandals mean. The ring is the family ring. This father wants to celebrate. Prodigal is also how we might describe the farmer who irrationally leaves behind 99 sheep to find one that is missing. 
Prodigal is how we might define a woman who frantically searches for a lost coin and then lavishly spends its whole value on a party for her friends. Prodigal is how we describe Jesus who welcomes sinners and feasts with them. Prodigal is how we describe the God who goes beyond justice and rolls out the welcome mat of mercy and wholeness when we repent from our sin. Still not the end of the story. Now the elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked, what was going on? He replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he got him back safe and sound. Then the older brother became angry. He refused to go in to the party. His father came out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father this way. Listen, for all of these years I have been working like a slave for you. I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you never even gave me a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes home, he devoured your property with prostitutes. When this son of yours comes home, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you were always with me. Everything that is mine is yours. But we had to rejoice and to celebrate because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Turns out that the sinner son is not the only one who got lost. He's not the only one who needs the father to come looking for him. The righteous son is also lost, alienated not only from his brother, but from his father, who wants the family to be whole and to celebrate together. Those righteous religious leaders who grumble about the company that Jesus keeps are themselves lost sheep, lost coins, the lost elder son, who are missing out on a really excellent party because they insist on labeling some people sinners while protecting their own righteous image. Most of us probably do not think of ourselves as sinners in the same sense that the Pharisees thought about Jesus' friends. We might make mistakes, but we try to do the right thing. We try to take care of others. We generally play by the rules. In that sense, we might be counted among Luke's righteous folks, good people, upstanding citizens. That's exactly why the labels of sinner and righteous are so unhelpful in our journey of faith. They define us by what we have done. And they allow us to separate ourselves from one another. What if we thought of ourselves as lost instead? Remember those stories we shared earlier? 
Maybe I'm responsible for getting lost, like the younger son. Maybe I got lost by accident, like a sheep grazing along and not paying attention to the rest of the flock. Maybe I got lost by no fault of my own, like the coin. If we can remember our lostness, whether we are lost sinners or lost righteous, then we can also remember that we are found. Finding is not something that we earn or do for ourselves. There can be no self-righteousness among the found. We are found by a prodigal God who searches for sinners and righteous alike. We are found by a prodigal God who celebrates when the family is together again. We are found by a prodigal God for a life of extravagant hospitality, a life of foolish grace and absolutely irrational joy. We are all of us found. May it be so. Amen.